The boomer problem. Seriously, Cheryl, you've been part of the team for four months, Connie began. Tonight's the first time you've joined us. Don't think of leaving without having at least one drink. And maybe shake a leg or two, added Nancy with a grin. It's Friday night, and the place will be buzzing. You're quite the looker, so mingling won't be an issue. Just one drink, then I'm heading home, Cheryl declared. No dancing or socializing for me. Cheryl, just curious, Helen chimed in, are you into women? Absolutely not, Cheryl replied, puzzled by her colleague's assumptions. Only Connie was privy to Cheryl's backstory before she joined the XYZ company. Cheryl, with her striking brunette hair and standing at 5 feet 4, had a pleasant appearance, complemented by her green eyes and notable legs, though she was modest in her self-description. Connie, with her blonde locks and petite stature, had a fuller figure, which seemed to draw attention. Despite being slightly heavier, her confidence made her popular. Nancy, the youngest at 30 and tallest, had a leaner frame, while Helen, the eldest at 44, balanced work and family life. Cheryl's 15-year marriage had dissolved nearly a year ago, leaving her emotionally guarded, hence her reluctance to dive back into the social scene. Why avoid meeting someone new if you're not interested in women? Nancy inquired. Because my last relationship ended badly, Cheryl retorted sharply. And let's be real, a place like this isn't where you find lasting connections, just fleeting encounters. The others, except Connie, were taken aback by Cheryl's blunt words. They waited for her to share more, but she remained silent, scanning the room until her gaze settled on a man across the way. Nancy and Connie noticed Cheryl's intense focus. She seemed lost in thought, reminded of her past, especially her marriage, by a nostalgic song that played in her mind. Connie, a regular at the bar, acknowledged a few acquaintances with a wave, receiving friendly gestures in return. As one of the men approached their table, Cheryl, seemingly drawn by curiosity, moved towards the table he had vacated. Among the patrons was an unfamiliar man with dark hair, lean yet toned. He averted his gaze, subtly excusing himself, and strolled towards the restrooms. Cheryl, attempting to follow the mysterious man, was briefly delayed by invitations to dance, one overly eager individual going as far as to physically halt her progress, prompting a sharp rebuke from her to release her arm. Connie hastened to Cheryl's aid, joined by Roger, the man initially approaching their table. Concerned, Connie inquired about Cheryl's distress. However, Cheryl, fixated, questioned Roger about the man who had retreated to the bathroom. Connie, attempting to offer perspective, cautioned Cheryl about the pitfalls of instant attraction, suggesting the man might already be committed. Undeterred, Cheryl confirmed the man's identity as Rob Thomas with Roger affirming his acquaintance. Praising Rob's work ethic and elusive nature, noting his limited social appearances due to a significant personal commitment. Cheryl, emotionally stirred, disclosed her unintentional role in Rob's abrupt departure. Connie empathized, suggesting the discrepancy in attraction preferences as the cause, hinting at Rob's possible specific tastes. Cheryl's inquiry about Rob's significant other led to Roger's playful hint at a non-traditional preference, revealing Rob's passion for a particularly impressive car, humorously personifying it with feminine attributes. Cheryl gazed at Roger, bewildered. Excuse me, she inquired. Roger explained, Rob seems to avoid dating. He's devoted to his car. The only woman in his life, as far as I know, is his mother. That noise we just heard. That was his car speeding off, leaving me here without a ride. Looks like I might need to catch a lift with someone else unless I make a new friend tonight. He gave Connie a playful look. Connie responded, well, I might be tied up trying to calm a friend down tonight. But let's take a rain check on that. After the evening, Connie drove Cheryl home, where she noticed numerous photos of Cheryl and Rob together. The one that stood out was a prominent wedding photo where Cheryl appeared blissfully joyful, as if she had married the love of her life and was overjoyed. Rob looked genuinely happy as well, though younger. This made Connie ponder what had changed, leading Cheryl to become the sorrowful and weary person she now was. Connie also felt unsettled about Rob. He seemed unnervingly distant from the woman he once vowed to love and cherish forever. The mystery deepened for Connie, and her curiosity wasn't just because of her friendship with Cheryl. From the moment she saw Rob at the bar before he discreetly exited, Connie felt a pause in time. Cheryl came out of the bathroom wearing a long flannel robe, her makeup removed, revealing a flushed and tear-streaked face. She sat on the couch, pulling her knees to her chest, still shedding tears. Connie joined her on the sofa, urging her to open up. Why don't you tell me everything, dear? She suggested. It might feel better to let it out. And I can't assist you with your feelings towards him if I don't know the whole story. Cheryl straightened up, giving Connie a look of disbelief. I don't want vengeance, Connie. I'm the one who failed. What I truly desire is to have my husband back. Confused, Connie asked, but didn't you get divorced? Wasn't there a moment in court to oppose it? Cheryl earnestly replied, I'd do anything for another chance with him. I long for us to be together again, in any capacity. Connie stared at Cheryl, taken aback by her unexpected choice of words. Don't think I'm being irrational, Cheryl said with intensity. Rob isn't just a casual fling kind of guy. If he and I started something, even casually, it would inevitably turn into something more significant. 
I just need to find a way to re-enter his life. And even if it was just a temporary connection, I would embrace it without hesitation. He's my destined partner. We're supposed to be together, she declared fervently. Every moment we're separated, I feel incomplete. Tani observed Cheryl closely. Throughout their acquaintance, she had never seen Cheryl show such strong emotions. Cheryl, sitting there without any makeup, appeared both older and more naive, revealing her vulnerability. Although Cheryl was nearing 40, the depth of her emotions made her seem beyond her years. Rob and I got married when we were 22, Cheryl reminisced. We met in college and married shortly after graduation. I hailed from a small farming community in Iowa, and Rob was a New Yorker. Our backgrounds were worlds apart, yet we connected instantly at a college event. It was at a fundraiser for an environmental group. Both of us were there with other dates, but that didn't seem to matter. We felt a strong connection almost immediately. It was as though there was a spark between us. We only had eyes for each other, oblivious to our surroundings. The situation became awkward when my date began to show his annoyance. Fortunately, Rob's date intervened, suggesting he take her home. I'm quite interested in this cause, Rob remarked to his date, smiling in my direction. Perhaps I should take you home and return here afterward. That might be wise, she agreed, hinting that Rob wouldn't be alone for long. I turned to my date and asked if he could drive me home. He glared at me with disdain. Forget it, he retorted sharply. I won't waste my effort on such pretense. Why should I bother taking you back, just so you can return and meet up with someone else? With that, he stormed off, leaving me there alone. Dating Rob was a unique experience compared to my past relationships. I hadn't really dated much, but it was clear to me that being with Rob was different. From the start, there was a natural ease between us, bypassing the usual getting to know you phase. The moment he returned to the party, he found me waiting, and before formal introductions were made, we sensed a unique connection. From our first meeting, it felt like we were predestined to be together, eliminating any need for further dating explorations. The question of exclusivity was redundant. We intuitively understood our future was together. Our conversations shifted from individual aspirations to shared dreams. Our backgrounds and prior experiences varied. Rob, at 22, had his fair share of relationships. I, newly introduced to dating, aspired to maintain a tradition of waiting until marriage, a value cherished in my family lineage. Initially, I anticipated Rob's hesitation regarding my decision, prepared to compromise if needed. However, Rob respected my choice, expressing contentment and simply being with me. Our bond was profound, transcending physical desires. Rob's affection was abundant, seemingly limitless, enriching my life immeasurably. As our relationship became known, inquiries from past acquaintances emerged. One individual hinted at intimacy, to which I responded with a reference to Rob's role in my life decision, underscoring my commitment to our exclusive bond. That was the vision we shared. My lips were meant for Rob's kisses, my chest for his caresses. I envisioned a future where we were intimately connected, symbolized by our eventual union. When we danced, his hands found a natural resting place on my lower back. I dreamt of carrying his children, and most importantly, my heart was fully devoted to him. Life post-college felt strange. Until meeting Rob, I had pictured returning to my hometown, possibly finding a job in a nearby city. However, as graduation neared, the thought of leaving him became unbearable. I was consumed with uncertainty. It dawned on me that our discussions of love and a shared future held genuine weight. Leaving him would be as impossible as leaving behind a part of myself. I couldn't understand why Rob seemed less troubled by our impending separation. I naively heeded a classmate's claim that men were inherently different, less driven by emotion and more by physical connection, suggesting that our bond might not affect Rob as deeply due to the lack of a sexual relationship. This perspective made some sense, reflecting the stereotype of men engaging in fleeting encounters without emotional aftermath, leaving women to grapple with feelings of rejection and self-doubt. Compelled by these thoughts, I decided to confront Rob, needing to express my feelings and understand his apparent indifference about our separation. I feared he might be losing interest, seeking a more casual relationship. Looking back, I realized that had I grasped this lesson sooner, Rob and I might still be together. I vividly recall bursting into his room, where he was studying, to challenge his feelings for me. I accused him of indifference towards our separation after graduation, overwhelmed by the prospect of being apart. Rob's response took me aback. He revealed his own struggle, debating whether to follow me or invite me to join him, weighing the benefits for both our futures and potentially our family. My eyes widened in surprise. Iowa has that quaint, small-town feel and is better for families, he explained. But the job opportunities for us are limited. New York, however, offers immense career prospects typical of a big city, yet it's not the place I'd prefer for raising a family. So, I thought the best solution is to rent an apartment here, move in together, and start job hunting. Once we're financially stable, we can get married and... He couldn't finish his thought. As the reality of his words sank in, I couldn't help but pull him close and kiss him passionately, overwhelmed by emotion and affection. He attempted to divert my attention to the apartment listings he had prepared, but I was too caught up in the moment. 
My excitement was palpable, and I was filled with a longing that, if he hadn't been so considerate of my wishes to wait until marriage, might have overwhelmed me. I might have given in to my desires right there in the dormitory common room, indifferent to the open door and potential onlookers. Why didn't you share this with me sooner? I finally inquired. He replied, I didn't think it needed discussion. We've always known since our first meeting that we wouldn't be separated, right? Sometimes, I just need a reminder, I admitted, fighting back tears. Our initial apartment was far from ideal, freezing in winter, sweltering in summer, with strange noises, limited storage, and constant repairs needed. Yet, I cherished it as if it were a luxurious estate. Rob landed a sales job shortly after graduating, and after some time, I secured a part-time position that eventually led to full-time work. Every penny we earned was saved for our wedding and honeymoon. I would have happily married Rob at the courthouse if he had proposed, but he insisted on a proper celebration to avoid any future regrets. His family generously contributed financially to our wedding plans and execution, unlike my family, who couldn't or wouldn't assist. I believe my parents were dismayed by my decision to not return home after graduation, possibly suspecting an unplanned pregnancy as the reason. It took many visits and time for them to reluctantly welcome Rob and acknowledge our genuine affection for each other. The anticipation of our wedding intensified my desire for Rob, leading me to question my commitment to remain abstinent until marriage. In the fortnight preceding our wedding, I began sleeping in Rob's bed, and during some nights, his unintentional caresses tempted me to consider abandoning our pledge. There were moments when his accidental closeness in sleep drove me to contemplate acting on my desires, fueled by the intense emotion and physical connection between us. Our wedding night marked a pivotal moment in my life. We managed to save just enough for a modest cabin on a cruise ship, but the size or quality of the cabin didn't bother us because we hardly spent any time exploring the ship. I'm thankful we didn't allocate more money for a fancier cabin or dining options. That would have been pointless since, during our 10-day cruise, we barely left our cabin three or four times. Rob mentioned that I was naturally inclined towards intimacy. I was insatiable. Throughout those 10 days, I explored new dimensions of intimacy. That honeymoon journey transformed me from a naive individual to someone fully immersed in our passionate bond. We explored our desires extensively. I returned from the honeymoon feeling transformed in every way. In the subsequent years, our bond deepened. We both progressed in our careers, prioritizing our relationship above all. Rob transitioned from sales to marketing, avoiding the travel demands of sales to prioritize our relationship. Similarly, I was recognized as a dedicated employee at work, yet I made it clear that my time with Rob was paramount. There were moments when my commitment to work-life balance was tested, and I faced the possibility of job loss for not staying late. My response to my manager was clear, while I valued my job, it could never replace the irreplaceable bond I had with Rob. Over time, we improved our living situation and, influenced by family discussions, we started contemplating parenthood. We meticulously planned for it, deciding on the ideal timing and alignment with our lives and desires. Our marriage seemed flawless, a testament to Rob's efforts to keep our relationship vibrant and dynamic. He was always thoughtful, surprising me with gestures and planning various activities to keep our connection lively. We explored hobbies together, from acting to fencing, and even attempted rock climbing, where we humorously discovered our shared fear of heights. Our connection was wonderful, yet I was oblivious to it. I suppose I had started to overlook Rob and all that he contributed to our relationship. In my office, surrounded by younger colleagues, I often felt out of place. Whenever I mentioned my 14-year marriage, I'd see their surprised reactions. You were getting married when I was just five, one colleague remarked. Their tales of adventurous evenings and diverse romantic encounters sparked my curiosity. Conversations about their experiences with men of various builds and backgrounds intrigued me. Nearing 40, I realized I had only experienced intimacy with Rob. I couldn't contribute to conversations about wild nights or spontaneous encounters. Nor had I faced the dilemma of juggling multiple dates in one evening. My experiences were limited to monogamy. One colleague bluntly labeled me as outdated, a relic from a bygone era. This led me to contemplate the idea of exploring beyond my relationship with Rob, an idea that soon dominated my thoughts. Once, I naively mentioned considering an open conversation with Rob about this. The response was immediate and sharp. Are you insane? They challenged. Your husband won't agree to that. Men want exclusivity. And even if he did agree, could you handle the reverse? Tina, a friend of mine, contrasted me with the office's younger temp. Molly, highlighting the superficial preferences she perceived men to have. Molly, recently graduated, stood out with her striking figure and youthful energy, embodying the type of allure that seemed to captivate the attention of many. Can you compete with something like that? Tina inquired. I just shook my head, knowing Molly had shared her aspirations of a life and partnership akin to mine and Rob's. The thought of Molly and Rob together, while I ventured into unknown territory, was unnerving. I knew I wouldn't want to lose him. I decided, given this would be a one-time exploration, to contemplate what I sought in a partner. 
Each option had its merits, and given Rob and I were approaching our forties, perhaps someone younger, full of energy, might be intriguing. After pondering for several days, my decision was influenced by my concerns about Rob and Molly, leading me to opt for youthful vigor. Eventually, I connected with David Parker, one of our college interns. It took a while to develop our relationship. We started spending time together outside of work, and he eventually made a tentative move. His forwardness led us to a hotel rendezvous one lunchtime. The experience was long-lasting as I had anticipated, but it was far from satisfying. His inexperience was evident, making the encounter feel clumsy and inconsiderate. After he left, I felt used and regretful, shedding tears over my choices. Returning home, I couldn't face Rob, feigning illness instead. His tender care only intensified my guilt, making me feel undeserving of such a devoted partner. Word soon spread at work about my encounter with David. He boasted about it, tarnishing my reputation. My colleagues began to treat me differently, and some even acted inappropriately towards me. I realized my previous image of a committed, respected woman had changed, attracting unwanted attention. David continued to pursue me, but I firmly rejected him and threatened legal action against any further advances. His interactions with me were secretive, only acknowledging our liaison to enhance his status among peers. I had initially been flattered by his youthful appeal, but it became clear that his intentions and perception were quite different from my own. He never found me appealing, just someone he could take advantage of. He felt embarrassed at the thought of being associated with someone my age, even mentioning how close in age I was to his mother. My friends, who initially encouraged me, assured me that I had just chosen the wrong man. Tina pointed out that Rob and I started dating when we were younger anyway. Perhaps, she suggested, what I needed was a mature, understanding man who had more experience and valued discretion, given he might have as much at stake as I did. I wouldn't usually entertain the idea, but the pressure from my friends to move past my experiences with Dave made me reconsider. They noticed a change in my behavior post-Dave and warned that Rob might sense something was off. But Rob was perceptive. Having been together for so long, he could tell something was amiss, even though he couldn't pinpoint what it was, ever since I came home feigning illness. Then came Henry, whom I met online while seeking an older man for companionship. He seemed ideal, a man in distress due to his wife's prolonged illness and craving intimacy. My sympathy for him was overwhelming, leading me to believe I should assist him in his sorrow. Yet, the reality was disheartening. Our first encounter was challenging and short-lived. He tried to compensate with effort, but the sadness in his eyes made it hard for me to enjoy, forcing me to pretend satisfaction. The true disappointment hit when I discovered his story about his sick wife was fabricated. He was merely seeking more intimacy than his wife could provide, despite his own physical limitations. To make matters worse, he deceitfully took money from me, leaving me to sort out the financial mess without alerting Rob. Returning home filled with regret, I freshened up for Rob, with whom I shared a consistent and explorative intimate life. The issue lay within me, having been misled to believe I might find something better elsewhere. I noticed Rob's early return as I prepared dinner in my silk robe, hinting at the night's plans. His unusual silence and the sight of his briefcase in the living room raised my curiosity. I found him asleep in a spare bedroom, a silent testament to the distance between us. I smiled and walked over to him, thinking it was just one of our playful moments, but it turned out to be different. Cher, stay back a bit, he warned. I think I've caught a bug. He wouldn't let me nurse him back to health, insisting I shouldn't bother with dinner since he had lost his appetite. He preferred to be alone, which was unusual for us. I thought Rob was just being overprotective. It was tough for me because it was the first time since we got married that we didn't share our bed. I felt alone and restless all night. I missed Rob terribly, feeling more distant due to my recent encounter with Henry, which left me feeling regretful. I realized I had been taking Rob for granted and vowed to appreciate him more. After a few days, Rob recovered enough to return to our bed, but he was still too drained for intimacy and cautious about being close, fearing he might still be infectious. Meanwhile, my coworkers were filling my head with notions that what I was missing was not about age but rather about seeking thrilling experiences. They suggested I meet someone who was experienced, implying it would be harmless and could fulfill my desires without affecting my marriage. Driven by loneliness and curiosity, I ended up going to a bar with them to possibly meet someone, thinking I was doing this to somehow shield Rob from my restlessness. At the bar, a guy named Greg, known to my coworkers, approached us. He was upfront about wanting a casual encounter, which to me felt somewhat transactional, but I wasn't looking for anything serious. I got his number, thinking it might help me move past this phase. After a disappointing experience with Henry, I decided to explore my curiosity in the safety of my home. I called in sick and arranged for Greg to come over, planning it meticulously to ensure everything would be back to normal before Rob got home. When Greg disrobed, I was underwhelmed. His physique was unremarkable, certainly no match for my husband's. Confused by his confident strut, I soon realized his pride was based on his sizable anatomy. Once he initiated intimacy, it was lackluster and mechanical. His attempts at seduction were more amusing than arousing, 
with his cliched lines barely stifling my laughter. His overconfidence in his physical endowment overshadowed a lack of skill in lovemaking, revealing a misunderstanding of a woman's diverse needs for fulfillment. His boastful claim that I would become enamored with him only added to the absurdity. Hoping to expedite the encounter, I feigned engagement, yearning for it to end so I could focus on more meaningful pursuits, like preparing a meal for my husband. This experience highlighted the superficiality of physical attributes and reaffirmed my connection with my husband, whose compatibility extended beyond the physical. Greg's persistent inquiries during our mechanical interaction only emphasized his desperation. I placated him, eager to conclude and reclaim my space. His suggestion to change positions in pursuit of greater depth was met with my internal exasperation, longing for the ordeal to end. His size, while initially imposing, proved irrelevant. The physical discomfort and lack of emotional connection made the experience unfulfilling. This reaffirmed my belief in the necessity of love and compatibility in a relationship, value starkly absent with Greg. At that moment, I thought I'd had a significant revelation, believing I'd uncovered a profound truth of life. Yet, I was oblivious to the fact that my world was about to be turned upside down in a matter of minutes. Greg gave me a playful smack and started to mimic a comical dance behind me. He seemed on the verge of an intense reaction, and I was eager for this to be over. I'm at the brink, he exclaimed. Where should I direct it? He inquired. Just go ahead, I replied, more out of indifference and pragmatism. I had no intention of dealing with any messy aftermath. Misinterpreting my response, he teased, oh, so you're looking for a more dramatic finish, huh? His guess was met with a sarcastic, absolutely, that's exactly what I want. Suddenly, Greg's energy seemed to drain, and he collapsed, his body weighing down on me. He muttered something unintelligible, sounding utterly spent. Finally, I thought, relieved it was over. Then, unexpected applause broke the silence. Greg and I looked around, shocked. He was too tired to react, and I was trapped under his weight. My heart sank as I realized the gravity of the situation. Hey, man, Greg started. Not a word more, Rob interjected sharply. I'm just going to take my things and leave. But if you say anything, believe me, it won't end well. Greg, despite his larger size, couldn't match Rob's intensity fueled by sheer anger. Greg, worn out from the previous exertions, stood no chance against Rob's palpable fury and determination. He yanked Greg away from me with a firm grip on his neck and arm. The force of the pull made Greg cry out in pain. He suffered a minor injury, leaving me with a painful mark. Greg's wristwatch also left a scrape on my skin as he was pulled away. Greg started to beg Rob for mercy, but it was futile. Rob struck Greg's face multiple times with quick, forceful punches, holding him up with his other arm. Then, he forcefully hit Greg's head against the floor and dragged him down our hardwood stairs by one leg. I got up from the bed, half expecting Rob to come back and confront me, but he didn't. Instead, he just looked at me, tears streaming down his face, then turned and left the house. I was in shock, standing motionless. Then the thought crossed my mind that Rob might be outside continuing the altercation with Greg. I panicked, fearing Rob would leave me for good as he mentioned before. Rushing back to the bedroom, I stood defensively in front of his dresser, determined not to let him leave without me. There, against the dresser, I was overwhelmed with regret and worry, realizing the gravity of what had happened. I was desperate to keep our relationship intact, even though I knew things could never be the same. I remembered reading about troubled marriages, some ending in separation, but I couldn't bear the thought of losing Rob. I was ready to do anything to keep him. As time passed, I grew anxious about why Rob hadn't returned. Descending the stairs, I saw Greg slowly recovering outside. Rob's car was gone, and he hadn't taken anything with him. He had left without a word, shattering my hopes of resolving things. Greg was struggling to stand, clearly injured, on our porch. I closed the door on him, alone and distraught, as he lay there in the harsh light of day. I couldn't bring myself to let him back in my home, especially with the risk of Rob returning and finding him there. It would only fuel suspicions of my allegiance to Greg. My concerns were short-lived, however, as the police arrived shortly after. They took Greg to the porch and awaited medical assistance, then came to my door. With no other vehicles visible, I contemplated feigning absence, hoping they'd leave. Yet, I realized the importance of aligning my account with Greg's to avoid discrepancies. Upon deciding to face the situation, I opened the door and feigned relief at the officer's presence, concocting a story of witnessing an assault on Greg and the subsequent theft, yet I feigned fear of retaliation to avoid providing details. Greg, amidst his struggle, claimed the culprits were four imposing figures who, after robbing him, stripped him of his clothing in jest. Despite the officers pressing for information to aid their investigation, I remained reticent, prioritizing my safety and anonymity. The officers left with a cautionary remark, implying my comfortable life could one day be disrupted, wishing I would understand the value of speaking up. Their words left me pondering, with a deep-seated unrest about my silence and its potential aftermath. After their departure, I collected Greg's belongings, anticipating his return for them. Alone, I sat in quiet contemplation, draped only in a robe, 
feeling the weight of the day's events. Disturbed by the phone's ring, I hoped for Rob's call, yet it was Tina from work. Dismissing her call, I sought solitude, only to be interrupted again by her persistent attempts to reach me. Resignedly, I requested Tina to refrain from further calls that night, as I was in no state for conversation. This isn't just a casual visit, she stated. I'm here to help you and Greg manage this situation. Do you have all of Greg's belongings, his clothes, phone, wallet, and car keys? I've got his clothes, phone, and car keys, I replied. But I couldn't find his wallet. It might still be in his pants. Good, I'll swing by shortly to pick them up, she responded. Once Greg has his phone, you two can coordinate your accounts. Greg's wife is working late. We'll convince her that Greg was mugged by bikers, using the same narrative you gave the police. You both should align your stories about the events and their descriptions. You might have to give a statement, and we must safeguard Greg's marriage. I'll just leave Greg's things outside when we're done talking, I retorted sharply. I don't need to speak with Greg. His marriage is none of my concern. Cheryl, what's gotten into you? She asked. And what about my marriage, Tina? I raised my voice, tears starting to flow. Who's going to salvage my marriage? What are you talking about? She asked, confused. I'm on my way. She then ended the call. Shortly after, Tina arrived at my doorstep. She knocked softly, and I greeted her, handing over Greg's belongings. What's the full story? She pressed. I shared the entire ordeal, leaving her astounded. Your husband did this to Greg. She questioned, and I confirmed with a nod. He hasn't returned yet, I admitted. We've never been separated like this. I'm at a loss. It's shocking to think your unassuming husband had such a confrontation with Greg, she commented. Did he take a lot of his belongings when he left? Not at all, I said. He just left. Then, perhaps you should stay home for a while, she suggested. If he's truly upset and avoiding you, he might come to collect his things while you're away. That sounds like what he would do, I agreed. But why does it matter to you? She probed. Haven't you been contemplating a change for some time now? Your recent actions suggest you were either looking to end your marriage or suspected he was unfaithful. Which is it? Neither, I said firmly. Rob would never betray me, just as I would never betray him. He's irreplaceable in my life, he's just right for me. I realized this just before things got complicated with Greg. Cheryl, then why did you get involved with those other people? She inquired. Because, knowingly or not, you did just that. You were unfaithful to your husband. I was just influenced by what you all were saying, I retorted. Rob was the only person I've ever been with. You all spoke of experimenting and experiencing variety. It made me feel outdated and dull. Cheryl, do you understand why we frequent clubs and bars? She probed. For the thrill and excitement, I responded. No, she said with a hint of sorrow. We do it because it's better than returning to an empty home. Any woman in that scene will tell you, we're searching for someone who will love and cherish us. Someone who won't judge us, who will stand by us, and who won't abandon us. We're all in search of love, the kind you have. I'm certain that every woman in that office envies what you have. That's the reason we dislike Molly. She's the only one open about her desires. So, we pretend to enjoy our lifestyle, but truthfully, many of us would switch places with you instantly. Oh no, I gasped, realizing my mistake. Do you know how many times I've left with a guy, hoping that the lackluster encounter was something more, just to have company for a party? She questioned. And when it comes to intimacy, what really matters is the effort to please out of love. It surpasses any fleeting pleasure derived from a momentary fling. She continued, often, you sense their indifference. They'll keep in touch only if you're available. And when they lose interest, they move on. The demands escalate. Initially, they're eager, but once satisfied, the dynamics change. You find yourself doing more just to maintain their attention. But ultimately, no matter what you do, it's never enough. They leave, condemning you for the actions you took to avoid loneliness. Believe me, each woman in that office envies you. I sobbed even harder then. Hey, she comforted, it might not be as terrible as you think. If he loves you as much as you say, maybe he'll come around. But you have to be here when he returns for his belongings. Reach out to every friend of his you can and find him, but never stop trying to win him back. Never give up. You won't find a love like his again. As we talked, she sifted through Greg's clothes but found no trace of his wallet. She asked me to hand it over to him once I located it. The following morning, I called off work again. I dressed in Rob's preferred outfit and began preparing his favorite dish. Then, I settled at the kitchen table and waited. By noon, there was no call or sign of him. I compiled a list of Rob's friends and started dialing them. No one had seen him. His workplace confirmed he took the day off. Driven by worry, I called his mother. She was also out of touch with him. I checked our bank accounts and, thankfully, found no unusual activity. Rob hadn't withdrawn large sums or made any sudden expenditures. My heart was heavy, my head throbbed, and my spirit was in agony, but waiting was all I could do. Eventually, I reported him missing to the police. They asked routine questions and promised to keep in touch, hinting that Rob might have left voluntarily. They mentioned the possibility of filing for abandonment if he didn't return within a set time frame. Exhausted, I dozed off on the sofa that night. Upon waking, I searched the house, hoping for any sign of his return. The next day, I resumed contacting Rob's friends. 
Once again, they had no news. However, when I reached out to Danny Am's household, his wife answered, and her response was curt and cold. A suspicion dawned on me. Are you certain? I pressed. That seemed to unleash her frustration. Rob is a decent man, she retorted sharply. Why can't you just leave him be? You've already caused him enough pain to drive him away. Just let him go. You've virtually ruined his life. He's left his job, he's without a home, and he's left everything to you, yet you still want to cause him more pain. It's no surprise that some men are resentful towards women. Actions like yours tarnish us all. Then she fell silent, her heavy breathing audible over the phone. Cheryl, can I ask you a question? She inquired. How do you feel knowing that you shattered the heart of a man who deeply loved you? I've seen you both in happier times, at barbecues and gatherings. I witnessed his affection for you. How does it feel to know that someone loved you so intensely, and you just discarded their feelings so carelessly? Does it make you feel proud of yourself? It seems not, because you're still meddling in his life. Cheryl, just stop. You've done enough damage. He's completely broken. So just back off. If you ever had any love for him during your marriage, just let him be. Then she hung up the phone with such force that my ears buzzed for moments after. Tears started flowing again uncontrollably. Why couldn't anyone understand that this was tormenting me too? I loved Rob deeply, perhaps as much as he loved me, and I recognized my role in our predicament. I was internally crumbling, yet no one seemed to care. Hours later, the phone rang with an unfamiliar number. Hello, I answered flatly. Where should I send his belongings? A furious woman demanded. Initially, I thought she referred to Rob. Greg's been caught again. I warned him last time that it would be over if he strayed again. He's all yours now, you wrecker of homes. Once I figure out where you are, I'm coming after you. But first, you should know the kind of man you're involved with. He has three young children relying on him. How could he neglect them? I doubt you understand, likely having no children of your own, messing around without thinking of the consequences. You've wrecked our family, and I hope you're pleased with yourself. She raged before ending the call abruptly. I was puzzled by her accusations. I was unaware of Greg's family situation. To me, he portrayed his marriage as nearly ended. Now, it likely would be. The thought of his children did weigh on me, but in my heart, I felt that was Greg's burden to bear, not mine. My focus was on mending things with Rob, willing to go to great lengths for reconciliation. I contemplated visiting Danny's place to speak with Angie, anticipating her anger, yet willing to face it if it meant getting any information about Rob. She was the only link to him recently. My dilemma was whether to meet Angie or stay in case Rob returned for his belongings. I phoned Angie, pleading for her to meet and hear my side, assuring her she could leave in a time if displeased. I hoped she could see it as a mere lapse in judgment and provide some information about Rob. She hesitated, suggesting a phone conversation instead, fearing a face-to-face -face might lead to a confrontation. She was uncertain about meeting or calling back, leaving me anxious. I sensed she needed to consult someone, possibly Rob or Danny, before deciding. I anxiously awaited her decision, hoping for a chance to explain. I nodded off again while sitting at the kitchen table. A knock on my door jolted me awake. Peering through the window, I noticed a woman on my back porch. I came around to the back when I saw no one at the front, she said with a smile. She seemed like a young woman, fresh out of college, probably here to sell something. I was keen to dismiss her quickly and return to wallowing in my gloom. Are you Cheryl Thomas? She asked, her voice bubbling with cheer. Yes, I replied, suspecting that sales companies must be harvesting personal data to target potential customers as they do online. She extended a stack of papers to me, which I took automatically. You've been served, she declared with an even wider smile. Have a great day, ma'am, and remember to care for your pet responsibly. I thought it was outrageous, the way she delivered those papers to me. In the past three days, I had barely eaten, sinking into a deep state of depression. Reading the papers, which were a petition for divorce, sent me into a deeper shock, causing me to collapse. As I fell, my gaze lingered on her as she confidently strode away, glancing at another set of papers. Was this her daily routine, tearing apart marriages without a second thought, then casually continuing with her life? I imagined her one day handing such papers to her own spouse. The anger bubbled inside me, yet I knew it wasn't her who had failed my marriage, it was me. Nevertheless, I was resolute in trying to mend it. I believed I had a friendly rapport with my neighbors, or at least, I like to think so. How long I lay there, crumpled in my doorway with those dreadful papers in hand, I couldn't say. But when I came to, I saw Mr. Smithers, my neighbor, nonchalantly mowing his lawn, seemingly indifferent to my plight. It seemed he preferred to ignore whatever mess he presumed I was in. I noticed my phone was ringing. Grasping it, I managed a weak hello. I expected to hear Angie's voice, but it was a man on the line. Good morning, Mrs. Thomas, or whatever your title might be, he said. I'd like to arrange to collect the documents and my payment. I was fed up with everyone assuming I was in the loop. Who might you be? I asked, unamused. My apologies, he replied. I'm Oscar Goldman, representing your former husband in the divorce proceedings. According to our agreement, I'm to retrieve the documents and a payment from you. In a few months, everything should be settled. 
Wait just a minute, I retorted. I'm no legal expert, but I understand there's more to it. I need a lawyer, and then we discuss the possibility of divorce or counseling. If we can't resolve our issues, then we talk about dividing assets. But I assure you, there won't be a divorce. Actually, he corrected firmly, in our state, a childless marriage can end in an uncontested divorce within 90 days, provided there are no disputes over property or finances. I handle this for a set fee. My client believes your case qualifies. I presume you've reviewed the proposal and the documents. Firstly, I haven't even looked at your documents, I exclaimed. And secondly, this divorce will be disputed. I refuse to end our marriage, regardless of what he offers. Everyone has their terms, he replied lightly. What are yours? I don't have terms, I snapped. Wait, I do have one. I'll agree to the divorce if it gets me the one thing I desire most. And what might that be? He inquired. I want my husband back, I declared, then abruptly hung up. Reviewing the documents, tears welled up again. Rob had left me everything, except his car and the clothes he wore. He even suggested sending the car to me. Why would I need his car when I had my own? It became clear that Rob wanted to escape our life together. He was ready to relinquish everything, not even sharing the reasons, seeking his freedom. But my love for him was too strong to let him go. Nearly a month later, despite my efforts in hiring a lawyer, the divorce was finalized. The judge seemed puzzled by what could have driven Rob to abandon everything we had built together just to get away from me. My attorney promptly pointed out that Rob earned significantly more than I did, suggesting the need for some financial arrangement. The judge seemed to think I had initiated this, addressing me directly, ma'am, when this gentleman left the state, he had nothing. From what I gather, he resigned from his job and left you all his possessions. What else do you expect to claim from him? Should I also incarcerate him on your behalf? I secretly wish the judge had the power to detain Rob, I would have visited him constantly, hoping for his forgiveness. My client hasn't been able to have even a short conversation with her husband since he departed, my lawyer interjected. Typically, there's an opportunity for the parties involved to discuss and resolve their issues. The judge retorted, counsel, you seem to be influenced by too many unrealistic stories online. No regulation requires such a meeting. The divorce documentation is in order, so the divorce is granted. Ideally, the assets would be divided equally, but this individual only wishes to retain some semblance of pride. Let's respect that. The divorce will be finalized in 60 days. Next case. With a strike of his gavel and a disapproving shake of his head, he moved on to the next case. I felt the sting of his silent judgment. Overwhelmed by the workplace atmosphere where men viewed me unfavorably and women dismissed me as foolish, I resigned. I lived off our savings for a while, managing the mortgage to make the house affordable on my own. Attempts to reconnect with friends were futile as rumors of my actions had spread, painting me as the one who disrupted lives and separated a father from his children. The sympathy for Rob was evident, while my suffering seemed unnoticed. A month post-divorce, Greg appeared at my door, intoxicated implying I owed him a favor for keeping quiet about Rob's involvement in his facial injury. His face bore the signs of surgery and possible nerve damage, affecting his facial expression. When he tried to force his way in, I resisted, securing the door and arming myself with a large kitchen knife. As he attempted to bypass the door chain, I made a small cut on his arm, signaling my determination to protect myself. He looked at me with disbelief. I think he assumed I was just playing around, but I truly despised him. You won't see me again, he said harshly. Forget it. Just in time, I said with a smirk, my husband is arriving. Greg scanned the area, and I detected a hint of worry in his eyes. He had no desire to confront Rob again. He hurried away, and that was the last I heard from him. In recent months, I've been reconnecting with Rob's mother. She's always treated me like family, and I believe I've shown her how deeply I care for her son. She recognizes my huge mistake, one that might be irreparable. She has forgiven me, occasionally sharing his messages with me, but she remains neutral and hasn't helped me reach out to him. She never even mentioned his return to our area. I can't imagine being with anyone else, ever. That's why I avoided going out with you all until now. Even tonight, my plan was just to have a drink and return home. My loneliness drove me to go out, possibly the same reason Rob did. Connie noticed Cheryl's renewed tears and sensed her distress. What's troubling you tonight? Connie inquired. It would have been our anniversary today, Cheryl replied, sobbing. Well, today could be a fresh start, right? Connie suggested. A fresh start for what? Cheryl asked, wiping her eyes. To reconcile, Connie clarified. You're not thinking of revenge, are you? He hasn't wronged you, if anything, the mistake was yours. But I'm talking about mending your relationship. Really? Cheryl brightened up. Absolutely, Connie affirmed. It might seem daunting, but it's not impossible. Cheryl looked puzzled. Why do you say that? Because you both still love each other, Connie explained. Such love is rare and meaningful. It might take time, and we'll likely face challenges, but if you're fully committed, we can make it happen. I'll do anything to reconcile with Rob, Cheryl declared. We need a plan, Connie responded. How does he feel about what transpired between you? I'm clueless, Cheryl admitted. We haven't spoken since he discovered my mistake. 
He vanished, and no one would share his whereabouts. Tonight was the first time I've laid eyes on him since then. It's no surprise you were startled, Connie remarked. I had no idea he was back, or that he was working nearby. I feel like I don't know him at all now, Cheryl confessed. Except for one thing. And what's that? Connie inquired. That there's a woman here who will always love him, Cheryl asserted. Regardless of everything. Sorry, dear, Connie said. But that's not enough. We need solid facts about his current state. The incident with you must have changed him. Did you spot any differences in him? He seems more built and distant, less open than before. He appears. More melancholy, Cheryl observed. What did you expect? Connie challenged. If he cared for you as much as you claim, your actions must have devastated him. It's no wonder he's wary. Trusting anyone, especially a woman and particularly you, will be a challenge for him. He'll do anything to avoid that pain again. It's going to be tough, but not impossible, right? Cheryl asked, her voice tinged with desperation. Why are you pursuing this? Connie shifted the conversation. Is this for your sake? Are you trying to reclaim something lost, or do you miss how he made you feel? Why is this so important to you? Because I love him, and I'm lost without him, Cheryl confessed. Since he left, my life has been empty. I'm just existing, waiting for the chance to make things right. Can't you find that connection with someone else? Connie questioned. There are plenty of people out there, and there are many people seeking companionship. Why not join them in their search? I've tried connecting with others, Cheryl responded sharply. But it's not just about physical attraction. No one else has made me feel the way Rob does. My attempts with other men, misguided as they were, weren't because I fell out of love with Rob or because I was tired of our relationship. I was merely curious about what my former colleagues were gossiping about. If I had known it would jeopardize my marriage, I wouldn't have risked it. I would have preferred to remain curious. But be careful, this might hurt both of you, Connie warned. If you truly love him as you claim, why would you put him through this agony? She looked at Cheryl. If you really love someone that much, why cause them pain? It's because he's in pain, just like I am, Cheryl replied. This way, there's hope for ending our pain and a chance for us to reunite and be happy again. Without trying, I doubt we'd survive much longer. All right, I'll start on Monday, Connie decided, her doubts eased by their conversation. Start what? Cheryl asked eagerly. We need to reconnect with him. Fortunately, I'm on good terms with his friend Roger from the bar. I'll meet him at work on Monday and try to get an introduction to Rob. I'll get Rob to open up to me. Once he trusts me, I'll learn how he feels about you. Then, I'll slowly share your feelings with him. Our aim is to get him to agree to meet with you. After that, we'll figure out our next move. That sounds wonderful, Cheryl said, her mood lifting. Then she looked concerned. What's in it for you? I believe in karma, Connie replied. I've had my share of fun times, but lately, that's been my issue. I don't want to be just the fun person anymore. I want something real, like what you had. So, maybe by helping you reconnect with your love, I'll find someone to help me with mine someday. Connie spent all day Sunday selecting her attire, knowing she needed to approach Rob carefully, a stark contrast to her past endeavors. She was well aware of her strengths and weaknesses and knew how to leverage them effectively. Her usual strategy involved dressing provocatively to catch a man's attention, but she knew that wouldn't work with Rob, who was not easily swayed by such tactics and had been through a lot already. A direct approach might just push him away. On Monday, she opted for subtlety, choosing a light fragrance and a dress that accentuated her figure without being too revealing. It was flattering, hinting at her curves without being overt. Arriving at Roger in Rob's office, she caught Roger's attention, who commented on her unusually modest attire. Connie, playing it cool, hinted at a potential intimate encounter, dangling at his bait to get a favor from him. She leveraged her occasional fling with Roger to manipulate him into helping her, without making any solid promises. Roger, eager and playful, was ready to do anything she asked, even joking about extreme measures to win her favor. Connie steered the conversation towards a friend she was concerned about, subtly pulling Roger into her plans without revealing her true intentions. She probably wants someone to ex her, she looks fucking miserable. Roger, I don't want you to ex her began Connie. There's no way I'd get involved with her, Roger declared. It's a lose-lose situation. Those troubled women are too sad to enjoy anything. Sometimes they come out of their gloom and accuse you of the worst. Other times, they harm themselves, and everyone blames you. Then you have the ones who become obsessed with you after the fact. No, I don't need that drama. Listen here, Connie cut in. You couldn't get her attention even if you wanted to. And I wouldn't want you to. Don't you remember? She was once married to your buddy Rob. Wow, Roger exclaimed. No wonder he steers clear of dating. I've tried setting him up a few times, and he just ignores them. Then I end up in the hot seat. He might have his charm, but once I introduce them, he doesn't even bother. He's just like he was at the bar last Friday. As soon as you guys came close to our table, he vanished. Roger imitated a gust of wind, thinking it was funny, but Connie just gave him a puzzled look. They weren't always like this, Connie remarked. They were deeply in love until something went wrong and they split up. They're both unhappy on their own, so I'm planning to get them back together. Good luck with that, Roger replied with a smirk. But how does that help me get any closer to you? 
What I need from you is to introduce me to him and stick around until we're chatting, Connie explained. I'll take it from there. Ah, so you're interested in your friend's ex. Quite bold of you. But hey, as long as it works out for me, I'm open to being part of the group, he said with a sly grin. Just the introduction, Connie insisted, smiling. She had spent the weekend thinking about her conversation with Cheryl and her own life choices. She realized she was tired of fleeting encounters that left her alone while everyone else returned to their significant others. She was ready to find a partner for herself. She also wanted to help Cheryl reconcile with Rob, although she was skeptical. The pain in Rob's eyes seemed deeper than Cheryl's. Connie doubted he could ever forgive someone who hurt him like that. If he did, good for Cheryl, but if not, Connie wouldn't mind having him around. Roger took her hand and led her down the corridor, knocking once before entering an office. The man inside was on the phone. He glanced up, acknowledging Roger with a nod and giving Connie a neutral look as he assessed her. What's going on, Rog? Rob asked, putting down the phone. Just the usual, pal, Roger replied. Talking about that fuel-chugging, loud beast of yours. Watch it, that's my pride and joy you're talking about, Rob said with a grin, implying his car was his most cherished possession, though Connie wasn't quite sure he was entirely joking. Remember last Friday, when I finally convinced you to join me and the guys for some bar hopping? Roger continued. Rob's expression became tense at the memory. I was about to introduce Connie to you to chat about your interests. Then you vanished, Roger added. Connie noticed Rob seemed lost in thought, his whole body tense with stress. She felt the need to ease the tension. I hope I didn't make you uncomfortable, she mentioned. It wasn't you, Rob responded flatly. It was someone else. As he spoke, Connie could see the pain in his eyes, as if the mere thought of Cheryl caused him immense distress. Connie started to understand that Rob's feelings for Cheryl were complex, filled with both intense love and possible resentment. Seeing an opportunity, Connie brightened up. I've always wanted one, she enthused. But I've only admired them from afar and don't know much about them. Like, what kind of upkeep is needed? I have so many questions. Rob's demeanor softened noticeably toward Connie. Initially, he had looked at her as if she was an unwelcome nuisance, but now he seemed to appraise her with a more open mind, perhaps imagining her associated with the car. I wouldn't want to overwhelm you with questions now, maybe we could talk more later. She suggested, picking up a notepad from his desk and jotting down her contact details for him to reach out after work. If you call me on my cell, I'm always available, she said. As she and Roger walked towards the door, Connie paused, looked back at Rob, and assured, it'll just be the two of us, and of course, your car. Then, they closed the door, leaving Rob in solitude. Once outside, noticing the empty hallway, Roger playfully hugged Connie, their laughter echoing in the empty space. How was that? He inquired, with a grin. Quite clever, she replied with a smirk. Roger, half-joking, prodded further, so, do I earn a special favor? I'm considering it, Connie teased. That's what you said about getting closer, he retorted, hopeful for a favor in return. Maybe, but not tonight, she clarified, after my chat with Rob. Are you setting me up? Roger half-joked, to which Connie, amused yet firm, responded, you'll have to work for it by getting him to call. She playfully tapped his chest, her mind elsewhere, contemplating her crap with Rob and how he had prioritized her over his desires. My comment, do you think these two are meant for each other? I think they are just creating a bunch of mess. Comment down below, sub and bell and I will catch you in the part 2 ending.